Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 404. Great episode for you today. Just a great episode. We're talking about conscientious objection to war and the tradition of conscientious objectors and what's going on with them today. What, what you can do if you are in the military and you've come to the conclusion that you simply cannot morally allow yourself to participate in this any longer. Where do you turn? Well, you turn really to our guest today, who is Bill Galvin. He is counseling coordinator at the Center on Conscience and War, which you can visit at centeronconscience.org. Bill is a Vietnam-era conscientious objector himself, and he's been working to support conscientious objectors since the early 1970s. Bill, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Tom. Before we went on, I was just telling you that I found out about you because I had a case of somebody who wrote to me saying, uh, I'm a conscientious objector, and I guess he had to prepare some kind of statement, or I don't, I don't even know what the steps are. In fact, I'm going to ask you about that a little later. And he wanted some guidance, and he thought, since I'm anti-war, I must know all this stuff. And I didn't know the first thing about it. So I sent him to Daniel McAdams at the Ron Paul Institute, and I said, what do I do with this guy? And he said, you've got to send him to Bill Galvin. He, he is the best. He's, he's, he'll know exactly what to do. And so then when I looked at your website, I thought, I would be an idiot not to have this guy on my show. This is very interesting to me, the whole history of conscientious objection. You, of course, yourself were a conscientious objector. I, I, I guess I want to ask, I, I do want to get into the history and where does this all get started in U.S. history, but I'm just so compelled by your own story and by the Vietnam era that part of me wants to know, given that there was so much opposition at that time, given that people were actually drafted, unlike today where people are volunteering for the military, people were drafted at that time, why didn't millions of people claim conscientious objector status? What was the obstacle to that? Well, there's first of all, there were lots of conscientious objectors. There were, I think, like 175,000. So there actually Oh, that's more than I lot. thought. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize there was so um, many. But... Part of it is the law is somewhat restrictive, okay? The, the law, I mean, and, and the law is broader now than it was throughout most of Vietnam, okay? But, but the law that was passed, actually, the, the law that's still in effect is essentially the law that was passed back in 1940 for the draft during World War II. And the law that was passed back then uh, said that uh, to be a conscientious objector, you had to be opposed to your you had to be opposed to participation in war in any form because of your religious training and belief. And so that restricted it uh, from a lot of folks. For example, if you weren't religious, you didn't qualify. Um, you know, if you thought, well, I know this war is wrong, but I don't know that I can say absolutely all war is wrong. Uh, you didn't qualify. Okay, so so, so you pretty of, much had to be a, you had to be a Quaker or something. Well, almost, that, sort of, but not quite. Okay, that's well, that's interesting because that goes back even further in the history because um, during World War One, the law said you actually had to be a member of a church that uh, that prohibited its members from being a part of war or the military to qualify. And then that church had to have this as a policy before the draft law went into effect for World War I. So, you know, so it was very restrictive. And to be honest, the law in 1940 was more broad because uh, it allowed for an individual to say, this is my belief. You don't have to necessarily belong to a particular church. I see. Okay. Now, what happened during the Vietnam War, there, there, there was there was a massive resistance uh, in many ways. Um, the, the non-registrants for the draft were at least half a million. Um, you know, there were, I mean, there was just, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of people who went AWOL from the military and things like that. And, and, and what happened was some of these conscientious objector cases uh, actually broadened the definition of conscientious objection. It started with uh, Dan Seeger. Uh, one of the questions on the on the forum at the time was, "Do you believe in a supreme being?" And Dan Seeger, um, he considered himself religious, but he said, uh, "That's not how I think of God." So he said no to that to that question, and the draft board turned him down. And ultimately, his case went to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court decided that you didn't have to believe in the Supreme Being to be a conscientious objector. So, and that happened in 1965. 
Okay, so then in the late 60s when I was dealing with it, one of the questions on the forum was, explain how your beliefs are religious. You know, and so, so I remember I played this stupid game where we, I looked up religion in the dictionary and I explained how Christianity fit within that definition, you know, which was kind of stupid. And, um, and you know, I was like so compliant back then. But, but anyway, uh, along came Elliot Welsh, who uh, around that time, who said, I'm not religious. And now he essentially believed the same thing that Dan Seeger believed. But Dan said he was religious. Elliot said he wasn't. And uh, they went to the Supreme Court again. And uh, the Supreme Court basically said uh, that ethical and moral beliefs qualify as well as religious beliefs. You know, so we've, so we've had that. So that was a major breakthrough. And that happened in 1970, I think, 70 or 71. You know, so that was at the end of the Vietnam period. But that did open uh, up okay. quite a bit. Okay. But you also had this business of everybody objecting to the Vietnam War as opposed to, you know, all war. Or, you know, the, the wording in the law is war in any form. And there were court cases about that, too. You know, there were people who were objecting to the Vietnam War primarily and, and who were applying, and they were getting turned down, and their cases went to court. And probably one of the most famous courses is the Gillette, one of the most famous cases is Gillette. And um, I think his name was Guy, Guy Gillette. And when he, uh, he lost his case, okay, they decided that he, he was what they called a selective objector. He objected to some wars and not others, and so he didn't qualify. But in that case, the Supreme Court said, uh, and this is a direct quote, unwillingness to deny the possibility of a change of mind in some future hypothetical circumstances may be no more than humble good sense. And it cast no doubt on the claimant's present sincerity of belief. So, so we were able to you know, take that and try to interpret this as widely as possible. And so uh, some of the, like one of the a quote that I've used many times, it was out of the handbook for conscientious objectors that came out, and, well, that, that got revised in the early 70s. And we, we said, uh, and this is what we said, we said, uh, you know, some will fight only when Allah commands, but Allah remains silent. Some will fight only in Armageddon, which seems to always lie in the future. Some would fight if there were no nuclear weapons, but there are. Some would fight if certain theoretical criteria could be met, but they can't be. In the meantime, these people may find themselves conscientiously opposed to participation in war in any form and can say so honestly. Okay, so, so we're doing all we can to broaden the definition to make it as inclusive as possible for you know, real people you know, who are facing these crises of conscience. But uh, I think the, the common thought throughout our culture, and it's perpetuated, I think, because especially the military, but in general our culture doesn't want to try to you know, affirm conscientious objection so much, you know, is that if you really, you know, the only people who really qualify to this are like Amish and people like that, you know, and then it right. doesn't really apply to real people. Right. Well, that, uh, well, speaking of that, today things are somewhat different in that we don't have the draft, and I think people, if anything, might even be less sympathetic to conscientious objection mm -hmm. because you knew what you were signing up for, I think would be the argument. I'm sure you, I'm sure you get that. Yep. But there must be people who go there who see things, and the things that they see cause them to engage in real soul-searching. It's not just that, that it's scary and I don't want to be over there anymore. I, I think it really is I simply cannot take part in this. So what has changed between how... Uh, conscientious objection cases were dealt with uh, in those days as compared to now when people did in fact volunteer for it. Is it more difficult or is it easier to get the exemption or to actually get discharged? It to some degree depends on the politics of the country. Uh, I would say that it's always been, except for the very end of the Vietnam period, uh, it's always been difficult to get out of the military as a conscientious objector and there have always been conscientious objectors in the military. Um, you know, the, uh, it's one thing to think, I would fight to defend my country. You know, I want to serve my country. Um, or even, you know, some of the cases we've got now that folks say, look, I thought of war as a, a necessary evil, not something I really wanted to do, but I was willing to do it because I thought it was 
necessary and sometimes you know a good thing to do given the circumstances. I end up here in a culture that's trying to get me all excited about killing people, even celebrating killing kids and babies, you know, and and that just struck me as wrong. You know, I, this just I mean this is not you know the, the, this is not the way I was thinking about war. I thought of war as a you know a necessary evil, not something to be excited about and celebrated. And and so that's one of the things. It's even in the training that some people get their their conscience, you know, moved. But n- virtually nobody who joins the military knows what they're getting into. I mean, recruiters are trained salespeople, and you really don't know, you know, what it is you're getting into when you join. And it's one thing to say in the abstract, I would fight to defend my country. It's quite another thing to be looking down the barrel of your gun at a live human being, and knowing you've got that person's life in your hands. You know that that does something to you. You know, deep deep in your conscience or soul or whatever you want to call it. And you know, the military, the military knows this. Okay, their own studies found. You know, I don't know if, how well folks know this, but 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 a General S. L. A. Marshall, who was the official Army historian for World War II, in his research found out that in many units, most units fewer than 25% of the soldiers were shooting their weapons at the enemy to kill people. And, and they did more research, and, and then there's, a, um, you know, there's been more research done by a guy named Grossman, uh, who, was, who was an Army psychologist. He actually taught at West Point for a while. And his research shows that you know, going throughout, it wasn't just U.S. soldiers in World War II, but throughout history. Uh, you know, most soldiers have not been trying to kill kill the enemy, so they they basically learned that you know normal human beings have an aversion to killing other people, uh, and so the military has changed its training, and and it's now you know specifically focused on overriding the conscience, overriding you know the this innate uh, sense that you know, it's wrong for me to kill somebody, and. And so the so the, the troops are more lethal now than they used to be because they've gone through that training. They actually they call it, you know, reflex training where you you just shoot your weapon uh, as a reflex rather than you know thinking about whether this is something I should do or not. But the problem is the conscience is still there. You know, the conscience is strong, and and we're seeing you know the statistics in recent years. I mean, you know, suicides among active duty soldiers are at an all time high. You know, roughly one a day. And, you know, the veterans, suicides among veterans, 22, 22 a day, 22 veterans a day kill themselves. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, and from our observation, this is directly tied in with the fact that military training, getting folks to do these things that's designed to just override your conscience. I mean, your conscience is still there and, and it's going to come back and you're going to have to deal with the reality of what you're doing. Well, suppose somebody is in that situation, as indeed this correspondent of mine is, what does he do? I mean, of course, he can contact the Center on Conscience and War and be guided through the process, but tell us, what is that process? Sure. And I just should mention that. The Center on Conscience and War, we've been around 75 years, and, uh, and uh, you can Google us, centeronconscience.org, and our, our toll-free number is 800 379 Two six seven nine, and we're probably the best group in the country for helping such people. And I would say, uh, well, th- it's a lengthy process. It's not easy. Uh, it starts with uh, submitting a written application, and the application has like twenty some questions on it. But there's about six or so that are really the important ones that deal with, you know, what is it that you believe, you know, how do your beliefs develop, and how do your beliefs influence your life. Uh, I mean, those those are the the key questions, and and the other, and they have to show how their beliefs have changed since they joined the military. Obviously, if you knew you were bo- opposed to being a part of war, why would you join the military? And you know, but for a lot of folks, you know, I mean, actually, almost everybody, you know, there's something that happened in their military service that triggered this. Sometimes it's in training, sometimes it's on the battlefield. Um, you know, it, it, it's different for everybody. One, one of the guys we had a, a couple years ago uh, who was, uh, you know, a very sincere libertarian. Uh, he was in the Navy, and they were on international waters and encountered a ship 
where they had to uh, search uh, the ship, and that included going through the personal belongings of the the crew of the other ship, and that so offended his libertarian you know mindset that that's what triggered his thought process and got him thinking about you know what he was a part of, you know. So so it's different for everybody, you know. I've 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 worked with conscientious objectors who were part of military, uh, you know, activities that he says it's only a matter, they, they said it's only a matter of luck that we did not start World War III. Um, you know, obviously the folks who, uh, you know, are on the battlefield and, and kill somebody or see their best friend die. And one of the guys we dealt with not who, a couple years ago was, was an interrogator at Abu Ghraib. And, and, and he was a conservative Christian and a very sincere Christian. And he said, you know, most of the people we, in, most of the people that we interrogated, um, they were just like the wrong, in the wrong place at the wrong time and got picked up somehow. And they had nothing to do with terrorism or, you know, Al Qaeda or anything like that. Um, but one day I had a genuine, you know, Islamic jihadist. And he told me that if he could, he would kill me. And he said that he was at peace with himself because he knew that what he was doing was the will of Allah. And then he challenged me on my faith. He said, you know, do you have that kind of peace in your faith? I mean, Jesus talked about loving your enemies and turning the other cheek. You know, how do you feel about what you're doing? And this guy said, at first, this really offended me that this you know, this, this Muslim would even be trying to talk to me about Jesus. But the question wouldn't go away. And he has to, and he could, he could cite that interview with that jihadist as his crystallizing moment. You know, so, so it's, it's different for everybody. And, and that's part of what we do here at the center is when they're, you know, when they get in touch with us is we, we listen to their story. We help them, you know, tell their story in the best way they possibly can because the legal issue is what do you believe? Well, how do you prove what you believe? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, but when you talk about experiences like, like that one, you know, then, you know, you can see, well, I can see how that could affect you. And I'm I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about all these different stories, as you say, it, it hits people in different ways, and you, you can't tell what's going to affect what person in what way, but I bet the testimonies of people, particularly those who would care to share them with a broader audience, if you were to, if you were to write them down and compile them into a free ebook, it would be a, fr- a quick and easy way to promote what the center is doing, get the word out about the center. I'm, I'm all for the free ebook that more or less writes itself. If you get people who are interested in sharing their testimony, you can collect 10 or 12 of them, you have a little book, and this can maybe be used for fundraising. I'm just thinking out loud here. That's a great idea. I was writing that down as you were saying it. Oh, good. Okay. I like to, I like to do what I can to help. Well, what else do you do at the center? I mean, is it just guiding people through the conscientious objection process? Are you also trying to, to educate the public about it? Like, what are your full range of activities? Sure. We, we do. Okay, but let me just finish about this process, and then I'll get Oh, yeah. My, my, my apologies. Yes. So, so, yeah, then they submit the written application, and then it's not an easy way out, I should say. Okay, then they have to go through a series of interviews, and, and, then, and then ultimately they get a report with a recommendation as to whether their application should be approved or not. Uh, we get, uh, then, then that comes back to the conscientious objector, and then if necessary, they can write a rebuttal, which we we can definitely help with that. Um, you know, their application is theirs. We can't really do that for them because they know what they believe better than anybody. But, you know, but with the rebuttal of, uh, the, you know, of what happens with them, uh, we can help with that even more. And then it just goes through the process and ultimately goes to the Pentagon level where it gets ultimately decided. So when somebody makes these statements, a lot of folks in the chain of command of the military are reading them. And we think that's pretty important for you know, raising consciousness level throughout the military. Um, but the other issue that sometimes becomes uh, difficult is you're still, the process takes at least six months, could take a year, even longer. And during that time, you're still in the military. And you've officially publicly stated, my conscience won't let me do this. And yet you're still required to obey orders and things like that. 
Uh, and so that often also runs into problems. And so we do, at various things, we we try to do what we can to to help folks who are, you know, dealing with those kinds of problems. So so there is a wide range of things we do in terms of the conscientious objector process besides help people put together their application. Um, but yeah, it'd be, but beyond that, yes, we do. We do some general outreach to educate uh, uh, the country about conscientious objection to encourage. Uh, young folks to think about what they're really getting into if they're thinking about joining the military. And in fact, yes, uh, we're actually recording this. I know it doesn't uh, play till next week, but we're recording this uh, on May 15th, which is International Conscientious Objector Day. I found that out, and if I had known in advance, I would have made sure this was today's episode. <laughs> well, um, yeah, but we had an event. We're here, we're in D.C., and we had an event last night at a at, at Bus Boys and Poets, which is a uh, which is a restaurant that has a political forum, an extra room that has all sorts of uh, activities in there, and we actually had uh, three conscientious objectors tell their story. We had some great music, and we just had kind of a a celebration of conscientious objection last night. I would be remiss uh, if I didn't ask you before letting you go if you feel comfortable saying something about your own experience as a conscientious objector. Sure, sure. Well, my, my, uh, I was a conscientious objector back during the Vietnam War facing the draft. Uh, my draft board was Catonsville. People who are old enough may know what that means. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Berrigan brothers, the Catholic priests. That, oh, that I, I sure that have, spells. yeah. Okay. Well, that was my draft board. So <laughs> they didn't like people like us, okay? So uh, my draft board turned me down. And in the end, I lucked out, and my lottery number was high enough that they did not draft me, but it came close. Uh, but, they, but they asked me, um, I remember that very vividly, I will never forget this, That's one of, probably one of the reasons I still do this work is because I remember this so vividly, and I remember the help I got. Um, you know, they asked me, they said, well, what if we turn you down and we draft you? And I remember saying, well, my, my mind was racing at that point, and, and I remember yeah. saying, well, I know I can't go in the Army. Um, I don't think it would be responsible to leave the country, so I don't see going to Canada as an option, so I guess that means I'll go to jail. And I said that thinking that I just might be going to jail, which you know, kind of scared me. You know, I was 20 years old or something, and you know, that didn't exactly excite me. Uh, now I, I now know a lot more about it than I did then. And... Uh, I am fairly certain I would not have gone to jail had had I not lucked out with the lottery, but but at the time uh, that's what I was thinking, you know. That's a very very frightening prospect to to be. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you can say, well, I'm being I'm being loyal to my conscience, and uh, you know, I guess I guess my place is to be in jail, but nobody really wants to do that, and to have your life taken away from you in effect, by right. people who think they can dispose of your life uh, however yeah. they want, is a shocking thing. Mm -hmm. So here you are doing what you are, you know, I mean, I'm not, uh, I can't tell you what divine providence has in mind for you, but you sure seem to be doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. So I'm really glad we had this chance to, to, to talk, and also I want to direct people, I will have a show notes page, uh, this is episode 404, so tomwoods.com slash 404, We'll have uh, information linking to your site and, and about our conversation, but also people can get there directly at, is it, at centeronconscience.org. So, yes. uh, Bill, mm -hmm. any parting words? Um, just everybody, well, no, I just thank you for your, uh, you know, for your interest in this. And, and I think, and people need to know that, you know, that the human spirit is against killing other people, except for psychopaths. And, and we need to affirm this, and we need to stop talking like people who say, I object to killing are weird, because they're not. They're, they're the norm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I couldn't agree more, and I say this as somebody who, when I was growing up and I was in high school and early college, you know, frankly, that is what I thought. I thought, what's wrong with these freaks? You know, why can't they just uh, salute the flag and go do what they're told? And I, you know, so I feel like I've been doing a form of penance since then in, in the writing and speaking that I've done. Because it's very easy to get caught up in conventional modes of thinking. And as you say, there are all different ways that they try to get you to, uh, uh, to adopt these and to forget about your natural inclination uh, not to kill people, 
and to have sympathy for other people. But uh, but that, as you say, that's always there. And the attempt to deny this is at the root of so much suffering and suicide and so on and so forth. So the work you're doing is heroic. I'm glad to have uh, spoken to you today. I hope people will check you out and uh, and visit our show notes page for today's episode, tomwoods.com slash 404. Bill, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right, everybody. Do please check out the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 404. And, you know, as I review my notes right now, I am kicking myself. I, there's one other thing I wanted to ask him. Bill is a former board member of the National Campaign for a Peace Tax Fund, which is an organization that lobbies to extend conscientious objector rights to taxpayers. Well, that sounds very interesting to me, and I would love to know about it, and I stupidly forgot to ask him, so maybe we'll talk to him again in the future. Oh, and by the way, a word to uh, all you good folks who are supporting the show as supporting listeners at supportinglisteners.com. The copy of my book, Real Descent, the Kindle version is one of the benefits that you get. It doesn't come to you automatically. It doesn't get emailed to you or anything. You have to sign into your account, and then you'll see how to get the book there. So it's, there's, no, there's no way for me to email it to you. Uh, Amazon doesn't allow that. If you, if you go through their Kindle program, they won't actually let you email copies of your book to people. You have to basically buy the book for everybody, which is more or less what I do. So you have to sign into your account, and then you'll see you just have to enter your email address and it'll get to you uh, shortly thereafter. So just please make note of that. All right, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes or Stitcher because I release a new episode every weekday. Can you believe that? Every single weekday, you get half an hour of interesting stuff. It's hard to believe, but it's true. You can get links to do that at tomwoods.com, which I hope you will visit because we've got copious show notes pages and lots of neat resources for you there. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.